Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third session in the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. This virtual session is facilitated by the Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared a Network of Virtual Training Series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this is giving you live access and archive access to all sessions as part of the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods, which is developed by Dr. Jim Werner in partnership with and the support of eight AHRQ-funded PBR Centers of Excellence. Just a few guidelines. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, please click on CDN Help or Clinical Dir Directors Network in the participants box and please type in uh, your questions or concerns in the chat box. If you have any audio uh, trouble, please click on the audio wizard located in the audio video box in the top left hand corner. If you are on the phone line, please have your phones on mute um, unless you are asking a question. Please be sure to uh, raise your hand, which is found also, the raise your hand button is found in the participants box, uh, the third button under your name. At this time, it is now my honor to turn the presentation over to Dr. James Warner. Welcome everyone to our, um, our, our second learning seminar for the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. Of course, our first session was an orientation. Um, so welcome today. Um, what, first, a, a housekeeping item. Um, I don't think all of the fellows are on yet, but I uh, wanted to just uh, uh, talk with you for a minute about the concept paper and the learning plan. Uh, those materials are almost ready to go. Uh, there's a small team of people that have been helping me develop those assignments. And um, the two of them are, are giving their final review today. And so I, we should have those to you tomorrow. Um, and then you can begin working on your concept paper and your learning plan. I uh, just wanted to say that in case our session goes long today and people need to drop off. OK. So um, I will, uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jolt Nagy Kaldi, our speaker. Uh, Jolt is Associate Professor and Director of Research at the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and he's the Network Director of the Oklahoma Physicians Resource Research Network, uh, uh, a, a really prominent PBRN. Um, and he's also the Director of COCONET2, the Coordinated Coalition of Primary Care Research Networks, which is one of the eight ARC-funded primary care PBRN centers of excellence. Coconut 2 comprises six PBRNs across five states, all of which use practice facilitators, and this is an area that Jolt has pioneered and that he'll be telling us more about today. Um, Jolt has partnered with clinicians to develop over a dozen health IT systems and applications that have improved, helped improve preventive service care and chronic disease management nationally. Uh, as I mentioned, he's an expert in use of practice facilitators. His PBRN is really the major innovator in developing this important role in PBRNs. Um, and he's also developed a lot of methods for training practice facilitators. He's one of the brightest lights in the PBRN field. I couldn't be more pleased that he will be talking with us today about PBRN development and the use of practice facil facilitators. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Jolt. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, it's, a, it's truly an honor for me to be part, participating in this course, and I appreciate the opportunity, as I see as an um, emerging uh, uh, researcher and always learning uh, person, hopefully uh, all the time, how important it is to, to continually train the next generation of, of uh, researchers in PBR and research, and this is a very interesting and rapidly evolving field, as I'm sure you, you know. What an illustrious group of uh, young investigators we have. I had the chance to look at your videos, and I'm really impressed. We have a, a range of uh, individuals with ver various expertise. Uh, we have two Andrews, Brian, Dennis. Hi, Dennis. We met each other before. Um, 
Matthew Ming, Deepak, and Sebastian, Nicole. Uh, and listening to your short presentations, I, I was really impressed how um, invested you are and you are becoming in PBR and research and how interested you are. Uh, we have individuals who are uh, co-director. Uh, Andrew Hunt is the co-director of a PBRN. Uh, perhaps uh, knows a little bit more about the inner workings of PBRNs. We have uh, Anne, who's uh, building a PBRN, I think, in Iowa. Um, and uh, we have others who are just joining uh, this great new movement uh, and trying to uh, uh, figure out ways how to work with PBRNs. Uh, this course is mostly about methods and methodology, and that kept coming back, understandably, that you're interested in PBR and research methods. This talk, in this talk, I will not talk too much about that. The topic of, of the talk is really about developing, maintaining PBRNs, but I would like to mention certain things that you might find interesting. What I will certainly talk about, and two of you mentioned the Sebastian was interested in methods, how to engage practices, and Nicole uh, said that she wants to know more how, about how to work with and within pre-BRNs and how to develop project ideas and research questions. Those are definitely uh, topics that I would like to address today. Okay, uh, let's start then. Um, a couple of other housekeeping items. If you have uh, a question for quick clarification and uh, would like to uh, interject or ask something that is very pertinent or would help the, the, the understanding of what I'm talking about or something is not clear, please, by all means, do so. You can either uh, ask, interrupt, or raise your hands, and I think uh, uh, the staff will monitor the chat box as well. E even if I'm not looking at that box, they will, they will let me know that there's a question. Mm -hmm. If, however, you have a more overarching question or a question that will require longer conversation, please uh, hold that uh, till the end, and uh, we'll definitely want to discuss that. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, I will try to keep this as interactive as possible, but as you know, this is much more difficult to, to do, to be interactive uh, online. So I have nothing significant to disclose. Uh, there are a couple of uh, very limited commercial research contracts, uh, one with a small company uh, working with spider venoms, um, and I may speak to that project a little bit uh, during my presentation, and an innovation center project that none of those pertain to this presentation. All other funding uh, include federal, state, and other uh, research funding. So what, what are we going to address today? Uh, we'll look at some definitions of PBRs, and I know you have addressed uh, some of that with Dr. Stange, and uh, I'm sure it was a, an outstanding lecture. Uh, I may provide a little bit uh, of, uh, of another view or maybe things that uh, you might benefit from in terms of having a, a, a another viewpoint on definitions in terms of PBRNs. Definitely we'll talk a lot about how to build and maintain PBRNs as the core of this talk. Uh, I would like to give you a lot of examples. So this is not really theory. I want this to be as practical as pass possible. Then we'll uh, shift gears a little bit, although very much connected, remaining connected to maintenance and PBR and uh, development, uh, talking a little bit about practice facilitation, uh, giving you examples of, of how practice facilitations work, what they do, and how they are useful and helpful. And then if I have a little bit of time, I really uh, wanted to talk a little about uh, the changing landscape of PBR and research, um, which you might find interesting. And originally, I think it was not in the curriculum, and I suggested that we have at least uh, we mentioned this uh, very current event. So definitions. Um, I like multiple definitions. So there's always a functional or trench definition. Uh, uh, of, of professional work, and what you see there is really very good. I like this def, uh, definition. Uh, Practice-based research is a type of research that is located in informed by and intended to improve primary care practice. This, in a nutshell, has pretty much everything that uh, PBRNs are. So it is located in. 
located in the community and not in academic medical centers. It is not a continuation or a spin-off of clinical trials networks. It is really something completely new, informed by, very important, especially in the age of patient-centered outcomes research and rediscovery of the old principle of that the end user, the community, the clinician, the patient needs to be involved from the beginning in developing the kind of research that produces a meaningful outcomes and then they help us disseminate those outcomes are from the beginning we're in the DNA of practice-based research networks. And of course intended to improve primary care practice and increasing this we will see not just the practice itself but the health of the population that the practice serves. So the longer definition is also nice that uh, explains a little bit more and uh, I adapted that slightly from the official HRT definition. So it tells you where we are, it's ambulatory practices, but increasingly including uh, dental, pharmacy, and uh, even other specialty areas. But the core of PBM work is still in ambulatory care. And that the insight, insight of the practicing clinicians is core, uh, is important as, as a driving force, and that it is their research questions, their daily problems, their issues that we respond to and, and, and sensitive to when we develop uh, the agenda of, P of the PBRM. Uh, we may not always talk about mission, but you will see in our case, uh, in, in our research network, the Oklahoma Physician <coughs> Resources Research Network, the OK PRM, this is a very important point, and uh, it is, I think, a good idea to develop mission statements for practice-based research network. So I give, provide again a short and a long version as an example and there are many ways and many uh, uh, types of mission and PBRMs but basically conducting health and healthcare research that matter in practice. This is straight out of the mouth of one of our uh, st stellar clinician members and board members uh, at one interview he noted that I like working with OKPRM because they do research that matters in my practice. And I think that again is sort of a canned version, a, a, high, a good summary of, of what, what we try to achieve. And the elaborate version again points to we want to do research in community settings and generate and disseminate both knowledge and resources, not just one or the other but both. Uh, that have a, a direct impact on both the health of the population and the health care we provide through primary care that allows us to improve the health of the population. And I would note here, as we will see uh, going along, that the mission of PBRs require a very unique infrastructure and a very specific multi-directional learning community. So what types of PBRs uh, are there? There are many ways to categorize them. I try to look at PBRNs on this slide from an organizational uh, linkage perspective. And uh, although it is a spectrum and uh, there are many types of PBRNs, I would sort of populate them in three larger groups. The most prevalent form is the academic PBRN. And, uh, a lot of you are members of it. Some of you are FQHC-based PBRNs. I think I have at least two of you, uh, Anne and uh, Nicole, I think, who belong to those more community-linked PBRNs. But most PBRNs are uh, connected to departments of family medicine or some um, professional, such as state chapters, uh, professional organizations. and. Uh, the advantage here is that the PBRN is very, uh, has a ro robust academic infrastructure support. The challenge, on the other hand, would be that they might work harder to uh, keep their fingers on the pulse of the community, making sure that they are always responding to their needs and developing an agenda that responds to community's needs. On the other uh, end of the spectrum, there are the fully community-based PBRs not linked to a large uh, academic or professional organization. Very few of these networks exist according to my knowledge, but there are some. Um, they tend to be, as you would think, extremely community-driven, patient-focused, uh, community coalitions and various uh, community-based organizations are, are 
driving the agenda of these organizations. The challenge here is, of course, uh, the lack of infrastructural support, which is a very significant challenge. Between the two models, there may be a third uh, type that it, you can call mixed or innovative academic PBRN that tries to combine the advantages of both, marrying the academic infrastructure with the strong uh, community base. And P OKPRN is such PBR, and I would like to propose to you that this seems to be, uh, when well executed, a very successful model that you may want to consider. Okay. Um, very briefly, I am not able to show you the animations. Unfortunately, this platform is not able to animate the, the slide, but it may be a little bit uh, busy, therefore. But PBRNs, as any grassroots organizations, have this kind of tra trajectory. And this is an actual rocket launch, picture of rocket launch into space, and you can see the times and the space uh, uh, events that I put on this timeline. So from starting from the 1800s and before, individual clinicians were very interested in asking questions and answering their questions, which could be considered research. Uh, Jim Mould, our mentor and uh, founder, famously said that every clinician is a researcher. Uh, uh, and um, we should be able to, and we have, need to create an environment where we can become researchers and clinicians can become researchers with the help of PBRMs. Um, the start point, of course, is the family medicine training programs in 1969, and then the North American Primary Care Research Group, uh, which uh, will have a meeting very soon in Cancun. I'm sure you heard about that. Uh, will be, and some of you may attend, uh, was uh, absolutely uh, an important factor to start a PBR movement. I will not go through all the steps. You can basically read the slides or read the, 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 the various steps. What I will point to is somewhere around, in my estimation, 2010 or so, there has been a, a somewhat gradual but still quite uh, uh, speedy and uh, significant change uh, and as the PBR research landscape changes, coinciding a little bit with the EHR era, but also with the patient and community centeredness. This is a very exciting time for you and for all of us to, to work in PBRs and do PBR research. And I would like to spend a little bit more time at the end of my talk to speak to that. By the way, a lot of information about the history is available. Larry Green, John Hickner, and others published now several publications and others as well that uh, um, explore the history now, many de decades history of PBRMs. This is, again, an, uh, an interesting way uh, to look at uh, the kind of research we do and uh, medical research in general. I'm sure you have seen uh, various uh, types of these slides and rendering. Um, interestingly, for a long time, uh, the second half, which is depicted with the uh, darker blue boxes, has not really been on the radar of, uh, of classic NIH research. And the second half of the pipeline sort of either didn't exist in the heads of, of, of classic clinical researchers or it was represented as some sort of one more step that you may need to do to bring clinical evidence into practice. Well, PBR researchers and those who work in the community and with communities know better. Um, publishing meta-analyses and systematic reviews are still very far from daily clinical applications. And most of you are clinicians, and I'm sure you fully agree with that and understand that. But what is interesting is when you sort of look into that previously black box, there are many steps and translational areas there that PBRNs cover, from the practice and community-based research, which is the classic PBR research, uh, to health policy. Um, there are many ways of advancing the translation of knowledge into practice. Most importantly, and what is mo most significantly emerging is the phase three or TT translation, which is, includes implementation and dissemination research and other types of research and includes quality improvement. And 
separating quality improvement from research does not make sense. We know that researching methods of better, uh, better methods to improve the quality of care is a legitimate and very important uh, area of research. And a lot of what you are doing and will be doing in PBRs will relate to that. So I would like to, in general, would like you to keep this in mind uh, uh, as we uh, talk about uh, PBR development and what kind of activities uh, we are involved in. Uh, let me speak a little bit about the development, uh, a natural uh, uh, um, genesis of, of PBRN, uh, uh, PBRNs and how they develop. So although there are many ways and different PBRNs and different trajectories, what a particular PBRN in a classic uh, situation would develop along the line of some sort of sigmoid curve, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, especially the classic older PBRs needed quite some time to uh, conceptualize what they want to do, gather the membership, and start uh, producing um, uh, usable and useful uh, research. And uh, the core membership in our case was established in, in 1994. And very wisely, they, from the beginning, uh, told Jim Mould, our academic uh, um, founder that, no, Jim, don't put research the first. Put resource in our name first and then research because we want this to be valuable to our members. We, we want this uh, network to be really participatory. We want this to deliver the kind of uh, useful resources and value to our members that then will allow them and, and help them uh, uh, make them more interested in uh, participating in research projects that uh, be will benefit both academia as well as the community of practices and the community of patients. Uh, our, this core membership is still with us. Uh, in, uh, we have major the majority of them, some of them are retired. Uh, then in about 2000 uh, or so, uh, when AHRQ uh, started funding PBRNs, and that is one of the turning points in, his in the history, uh, there was a generally uh, uh, an exponential increase in the activity and size of PBRNs. And uh, more recently, uh, uh, or more mature and other more mature networks have sort of a continuous slow turnover. And this time, while we have been building the network vertically and uh, trying to bring in more funding and do more projects, we still do that, but we are building what I call, would call the neural network. We are trying to uh, build more synops uh, synopses and more uh, uh, tentacles, more interactions with others. And the result of that is what you see in the P30 collaborations when PBRs come together at the national level and work together. So the individual ontogenesis of the PBRN and the uh, collective uh, genesis of the PBN community somehow are linked together through the types of activities and what type of improvement uh, occurs. Um, in terms of, uh, let's, let's go and look at uh, the topic of how to build and maintain a PBRN. Um, there's a lot of good, there are good materials out there. For a long time, uh, the PBN community uh, did not have uh, the kind of resources that classic clinical trials networks had and the methodology, and we didn't have the uh, good practices uh, handbooks. Uh, the, I'm happy to report that uh, there is change in that area. So if you go to the NetCrack website, um, a consortium of seven networks working with the tireless uh, Dr. Neil, Victoria Neal, um, uh, put together and continually uh, we are updating a PBRN uh, practice-based research good practices compendium. And this is now becoming an important piece of uh, a document as well as a very helpful resource for PBRNs, especially new PBRNs. Uh, I am going to address only the first chapter that our PBRN helped develop and that is about building PBRNs, but there are uh, now five other chapters, including method, methods, research methods, uh, and, and community engagement, which is the, the last chapter. Data analysis is, is one of the chapters. So I highly recommend this, this uh, uh, 
resource to you. So PBRNs are all about relationships. And relationship building is so important and there's the foundational layer of building a PBRN. Since it really, if you think about it, our laboratory is a network of human professional relationships. And every time that I fight with our academic institution uh, about infrastructural support and why PBRNs need to be treated uh, just as any other uh, asset, I say that if you're a basic scientist, would you keep your lab dirty? W would you not replace your equi equipment? Would you not do upgrades in your laboratory? You say, of course not. You would all do all of these things. When we uh, develop relationships, when we maintain relationships, and put money into building the infrastructure, this is what we're doing in PBR. And so that resonates a little bit more with uh, the CTSAs and or other infrastructural uh, resources that might invest into PBRN research. So in order to build relationships, what we found as a community, as, as a good practice, is to uh, have widely respected champions and commission leaders. We, our network had several of these, and they have been instrumental in establishing these relationships. So a network director typically would go out and meet with members, just like a congressman would, would do. Uh, the same ideas apply. You have to be out there. You have to be able to talk to people. You have to be able to uh, build and uh, maintain those personal and professional relationships that will become the basis of your work. Um, personal invitation is always uh, good. So again, following uh, the previous point, uh, being out there and have a multi-pronged way of reaching and engaging and communicating with your membership is extremely important. This cannot be done remotely or uh, in any other ways. There are some national PBRNs, the NRM, for example, that has been a challenge always, of course, uh, uh, how to uh, bring together and reach them uh, from a, a national center. Um, the participatory, we reflected upon the participatory nature uh, of PBR and how it has to be mission-oriented. Members need to feel that they have ownership of this organization. This is not only important at the baseline, but this is a continuing challenge for every PBR and ours included, how to make sure that they continually feel ownership of the organization and therefore they remain engaged. Uh, I also mentioned the direct value to members and how in our case, in our network, it was very important to put value first and and through that value, engage them in research. Uh, PBRNs and academic institutions tried multiple ways of engagement. Historically, this worked better for communities than uh, the, the, the classic academic way. When we approached them with research project, projects and asked them who is interested in answering this academic research question. Um, Bidirectional communication and collaboration. Uh, again, being able to receive just as much information from the membership that can guide the organization, then information that flows back to them from the various projects is very important. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, not a lot of pre-BRNs do this uh, strategic planning, but I would highly recommend that you, you consider that. Uh, as I will mention, our PBR is a nonprofit organization, so uh, uh, this is uh, particularly important for us. So what we, we do is that we have periodic uh, professional facilitated planning, uh, planning sessions, strategic, strategic planning sessions. It is very important that you have a person who is trained and has an experience and is an outsider who facilitates that. Um, you, that will allow you to find those critical areas uh, where value can be generated, the gaps uh, that you may or may not know about, that the membership is able to um, uh, tell you about. Uh, you can you know, apply various techniques for analysis or needs assessment or goals um, um, assessment uh, to develop effective strategies to achieve these goals. 
these are not very different from <laughs> goal-directed, uh, oriented patient care, if you think about it. And of course, you, are, you will be tracking the progress of, of the approaches and uh, uh, the, the achievement of goals. This is a very structured way of advancing, developing, advancing an organization. And again, several, uh, a lot of PBRs may not be doing this, but I highly recommend that you, you consider it. Uh, let me give you an example, just so I'm not that, that nebulous. We, are, uh, we had our last uh, um, board of directors retreat uh, for strategic planning in 2012. Uh, we hired a facilitator who has done this uh, with various uh, nonprofits and community uh, groups before. We surveyed the PBR membership and the board members prior to this and collected a lot of valuable information and input. Uh, we met with the facilitator and based on all of this input and with the expert expertise of the facilitator and what we have known about our PBRM, developed the agenda for this uh, day of uh, uh, retreat. Uh, and then you can see what basically following uh, the, the previously aligned uh, or outlined steps, we had uh, uh, taken a good look at the PBRN. We, we rediscovered and reworked our mission and vision statement. That was really very important. Uh, if your PBRN doesn't have a mission or and vision statement yet, I highly recommend that you develop one, uh, which is prominently on your website and prominently, of course, when you develop your uh, and prioritize your um, projects uh, is in your mind and in front of you to make sure that you s stay on the track uh, what your membership has uh, set for you. Uh, so we developed, reworked our mission and vision statement, which I will show the new one uh, just in a bit. Uh, and we did a, a risk sort of analysis. Then we looked at the gaps. Uh, we, very importantly, part of the strategic planning is that we envisioned OKPR and we had a daring vision of where OKPR should be in the next 10, 20 years and compared our current situation to that and uh, to see where the gaps are, where we should be going. We developed an action plan and then we summarized the decision, finalized the plan and not only disseminated the plan to our members and explained why and how this was uh, 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 was tried to represent their ideas, of course, with their continuing input. But we also try to review and update this plan as well as track the our achievement every year. So just to show that, here's an example. I, I don't expect that you would read all of this text, but this is the most up-to-date uh, tracking of our strategic plan. So you see some of these items are flagged accomplished. Uh, others are in progress uh, at various levels. And I think there may be a couple. These are not all uh, the plan points, but the important there, there are a couple where we are uh, not making as much progress as, as we would like to. Please notice that in addition to what you would think, again, mission, new updating mission vision statement, uh, leadership transition, which occurred uh, recently, uh, better marketing of the network, uh, organizational culture and program development, a recurring theme, as I mentioned, how to improve better member participation and engagement of the membership. And that is a relentless and continuing, uh, uh, it requires relentless and continuing work uh, on the uh, uh, part of the leadership as well as the membership to, to maintain the network fresh and, and appealing and always asking the question, how can we do better? How can we serve you better? What kind of resource, resources do you need? What kind of research should we do? I will speak to prioritization of research, uh, the research agenda a little bit later. So this is just an example for you to show that. And of course, we need a lot of infrastructure. We ma mentioned that there are special issues and problems with PBR infrastructure. And from the very beginning, as uh, with uh, other nonprofit or community-based organizations, uh, infrastructure funding is, is a significant issue. Uh, so this is an example of how, and I would like to speak to one of your questions. Uh, uh, again, Nicole asked how uh, we can uh, develop project ideas and research questions. So I suggest that you, you think about developing a systematic process for that. Uh, there are venues that we use to solicit project ideas from members. 
our listserv is very active, and I will show you uh, some examples uh, on that. Our convocation is, a, is an important point of every year where we not only engage with the membership and tell them what the network is doing, but uh, the, at the same time, we are engaging them to provide us input about what they are trying to or, or wanting to do, what they want us to uh, help them to do. And we also use increasingly use social media to, to increase the communication. So there are lots of venues. Uh, we also have a website, uh, a very active website that has a specific resource, and I'll show that screen later, that collects research ideas in a systematic manner. Then we have a structure in place that, that is able to um, prioritize and provide a vetting process for um, uh, selecting where we should go from here, where we should go in terms of research and where we should go in terms of uh, value uh, generation and dissemination provision. Uh, then we uh, want and continually uh, establish a professional partnership, a web of expertise, so just as researchers want to have a web of uh, relationships to various experts, PBRs also need this. Um, and these might include various community agencies, um, federal and local uh, in, uh, organizations and institutions, patient advisory groups, uh, community coalitions, and so forth. Uh, there will, I will show a map that will have a little bit of that. And of course, we need to make sure there is an efficient process to keep track of who we have and at what level of activity, who they are, uh, what their goals are, what projects they are participating in. So we developed an electronic secure database where we do that. Uh, early on, AJRQ had a, a two surveys called the PRINCE 1 and PRINCE 2 that you can look up online that collected some of this information. And so we still today, we have an adapted version of, of those surveys, of surveys uh, that we use as a basis uh, of collecting the type of information that we, we need from our members. We also have a yearly membership data drive when our uh, practice facilitators go out and collect, and now network coordinator, uh, collect uh, this and update the basic network information. That also relates to the membership and the tiers of membership. And I need to just quickly mention that uh, a lot of PBRs experimented with the uh, membership dues models or different levels of, uh, of membership. The dues uh, rarely work for us or not, not haven't, we, we haven't been able to really make up our mind, mind uh, a handful of networks introduce it successfully. Uh, our board still maintains that we would, we would like to look for other venues of support first. Uh, but we do have tiers of mem a membership in terms of the level of activity. And you will see that you, you know, have our active members, regular members, and we have an affiliate level of membership. And typically in a mature PBR, and you would say that about very roughly a third of these members are very active. Roughly another third are sort of occasionally in the affiliate position, and about a third who are not active at all. And we still want to keep them on the books because it, it once in a while somebody uh, says that, oh, this project really appeals to me, I would like to participate because I had a case in the past or I'm passionate about this one particular issue, and then they contribute. Or they, once in a while, they may be uh, contributing to the list of conversation. Uh, and so therefore, we don't want to exclude them. We would like to uh, have them even though they may not be that active. Um, there are other points, of course, of infra infrastructural management. So we need a study management infrastructure that is able to manage the kind of information. And there's, I'm sure your CTSAs and universities and organizations have access to REPCAP and various uh, study management applications and software that uh, you need to take advantage of and, and leverage. Um, we do need, as I mentioned, innovative processes for ongoing feedback both for research, the research agenda and uh, the resources that you were able to deliver. Um, and very important uh, in, in my mind is that uh, to be able to disseminate the best practices uh, that 
the network creates or best practice resources, there must be a, an overarching um, architecture in place to disseminate those. PBRs have struggled for some time to do that internally. There are emerging ways and models, uh, and I will speak a little bit about the, the health extension infrastructure and health extension system and how it can help us uh, PBR researchers disseminate uh, products of PBR research. And there are, of course, many other ways of tapping into and collaborating with your local resources. Unfortunately, a great resource, the PBR Resource Center, just uh, retired and currently ARC doesn't have more funding to run that, but some of the resources they have developed are still available online. So I encourage you to still uh, keep using or check out the ARC website uh, uh, and use some of the existing resources. And we hope that ARC will find additional funding uh, to run the PBR Resource Center continually. So let me show you a couple of examples. This is our listserv. Uh, it was established very early on, 1999. It's an asynchronous communication uh, method. And our members, especially the, the, the older, more established members, prefer this. Uh, method, uh, although uh, uh, social media is emerging, this is still attractive to them because it is it comes to them uh, when they want it to. Um, uh, they check their email. They can use Daily Digest or other functionality not to get each every individual email to clutter their email box. And our list is very active. Uh, you can see the particular examples of of what we do. So here, clinician discussions and uh, sending out summaries of uh, highly relevant um, evidence reviews. For example, now we are using the McMaster evidence review on a weekly and then monthly basis to, to inform our membership that they uh, really value highly. When uh, we, anytime we uh, ask our membership to rank uh, the usefulness of various resources, the listserv was on, on the top as, as a great resource. I will have another slide that shows a particular example of how we uh, are able to leverage that value. Staffing is, of course, a very important uh, point of any organization. Um, it needs to follow the mission, the vision, and the type of the organization. Uh, AHRQ has a very minimal requirements. I think that they require that the network has a, a director and suggest that it has some sort of network coordinator. I would go farther. I would say that the network coordinator is really essential and really important. And if, you can, if you're able to uh, 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 support a network coordinator, I highly recommend that. Uh, for a long time, our faculty sort of distributed the network coordinator tasks among ourselves and tried to uh, do that. It was nearly not as successful as more uh, uh, our current situation where we were able to hire um, a dedicated network coordinator who, by the way, supports uh, two networks in our state, our network and the pediatric network. Um, hiring and retaining these uh, folks are, are sometimes uh, difficult, and their professional training hasn't been really systematically addressed. This course, I'm very excited that this course might be able to uh, address uh, the ongoing training of PBR leadership, not only researchers, but only how, uh, but also how we can uh, uh, train and um, sustain uh, the leadership of PBRs, uh, develop best practices uh, for training and uh, supporting uh, network coordinators, practice facilitators, which is ongoing and then a PBR and directors. There's, according to my knowledge, there's no compendium or resource that uh, speaks to that specifically. This is an example of our specific PBRN uh, in architecture. So this is a 501c3 organization that is separate from the university, although very tightly linked and connected. And as I mentioned, it, it tries to marry the, the advantages of both. Um, the, the network, the, the, the organization has a board of directors, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, directed through and with uh, the bylaws that we have. 
Uh, these are reviewed and updated periodically. We have a president of, of the network. Uh, we have a network coordinator. And we have a research director who is the main linker, connector between that uh, uh, 5.1c3 and our department. The department provides tremendous uh, support, infrastructural support, to the 5.1c3. The hard part, the, the challenging part is, of course, how you can, in an academic environment, how you, how you can work with a nonprofit in a way that is aligned with the, the laws and the regulations of the university and uh, it does not create any sort of conflict of interest. And here I would say that the, the critical point for this kind of structure, but any other type of PBRM, is the buy-in of your department chair. Uh, or organization, higher organizational unit. Uh, to ensure that, we went as far as uh, involving Dr. Crawford, who, are, who, are, who is our chair, in, on our board of directors and for periodically for a time, I think it's a two-year period of rotation, he was on our board of directors. Not only he, he was very, and he's very invested, but had an extremely good inside look and understanding of the organization and the relationship and this allowed us to be able to continually leverage the resources of the department and academic resources for the benefit of the network without uh, concerns on the part of the university. Now, there are many financial and other barriers that you need to address, of course, and uh, we have to jump through a number of hoops to be able to clear, uh, uh, clearly keep the books separate and make sure when we receive research funding, we are able to show how, what is the linkage between the two. For example, we always have a contract in place. When we receive grants, uh, we uh, apply for the grant with the notion that the network needs to be supported as a laboratory. Uh, so we receive and request specific support for the network, but then we put uh, a service contract in place between the PBRM and the university to make sure that uh, the financials are, are cleanly uh, delineated and, um, and marked. Uh, you see the practice facilitators here listed as well. We call them practice enhancement, enhancement assistants who are usually responsible for linking a pod or a group of practices. And of course, we have many other uh, partners as well. Funding. Extremely uh, complicated, uh, difficult, and, uh, and challenging part of PBR and work. As you know, PBR has uh, done research for a long time on a shoestring budget. But more recently, uh, with the emergence of uh, community-based and patient-centered research, um, I think there are a number of opportunities for PBRs to leverage that. The CTSA process uh, is also another way for PBRs to be involved and, and uh, receive academic funding. But PBRs always uh, have to be uh, very creative. Uh, creative in terms of how to support their administrative and infrastructural fu uh, functioning, but also creative in terms of diversifying their, their portfolio of research to be able to tap into a variety of resources. In addition to academia, uh, foundations, um, various quality improvement organizations, more recently uh, contracting, contract work, or QI, uh, and working with ACOs are things that uh, are uh, attractive and intriguing for PBRs. In, in fact, AHRQ is working on another resource uh, um, that will give the PBM community more guidance about how to do contract work uh, for quality improvement or working with ACOs or other types of uh, uh, quality organizations. And it, is, it has been extremely important to strategically market the image and the value of PBRM to health, uh, vertically integrated health systems, health networks, uh, state legislators, um, in addition to other organizations, employers are also, uh, through wellness and uh, health assessment, for example, uh, employers can also be lever uh, involved uh, and uh, potentially even um, 
leveraged as a, as a funding resource. So this is uh, just an example of, the, of our attempts to diversify our funding. Of course, we have the usual academic source, sources nationally and state. But as you see on the right side, there, there's a, an emerging mm -hmm. list of working with uh, uh, using contracts to do quality as well as other types of research uh, with uh, Medicaid organizations, uh, state-based organizations, state quality improvement organizations, payers, insurers. I, I definitely uh, need to mention that and add them to the list. Both public and private are increasingly uh, interested in the kind of expertise that PBRs can provide, especially in the area of improving care quality but also in terms of measuring quality. Uh, employers and various uh, uh, companies that might specialize in, in popular either pop health, community health, uh, or wellness uh, in a certain place. And I put health systems uh, sort of there, which are also extremely important, especially in northern states where that are less rural and have more of their health system within the vertically integrated health systems um, to figure that uh, figure out how to crack that very tough knot and uh, either collision or cooperation hopefully of PBRNs and health systems is an extremely hot topic a very important topic and something that us together and definitely your generation need to figure out how to um, uh, facilitate. Uh, and how PBRNs can uh, propose value to health systems uh, in a way that uh, they might find interesting. It is not very easy. Uh, it is not always uh, to uh, not always easy because uh, they may these systems may have similar or parallel system uh, parallel uh, mechanisms in place to improve the quality of care, and they may or may not be interested in bringing in outside resources for a variety of reasons. But there are certain ways uh, where you can propose value and, and say that especially in the research and evaluation uh, areas, you might have and uh, most of the time you will have expertise that these health systems don't have that you can offer. Uh, our network, just very briefly, is a strong 21-year-old uh, uh, network with 270 primary care clinicians and sites and uh, a number of uh, practices. Uh, as you see, we are 501c3. We are sort of a uh, uh, mature network that is able to connect to a, a number of others. Uh, we were able to leverage a significant level of funding uh, and through our board of directors and community partners on our board, we are able to interface with a lot of organizations uh, uh, in the state as well as uh, uh, nationally. This is our mission statement and uh, our membership eligibility. I would highlight that the change that our members membership suggested was to, to say that we are a professional network for peer learning, sharing of resources, best practices, and practice-based research. And, and see, uh, observe that research is actually the last statement, which doesn't mean they don't care about it, but that it is some sort of community, learning community, and that professional network for learning that has been the most attractive uh, to our membership and that they wanted to emphasize. And as, as I mentioned, we have active members and affiliate members, but right now it, does, it is not reflected in terms of uh, uh, membership dues or payment, but it, it is more about the level of activity. And the active members do have access to more resources. They have a higher level of access to our practice facilitators and level of, for example, health IT resources than the affiliate members. So there's a little bit of care there to, be, uh, to have a higher level of activity. This is just briefly show, showing, I uh, uh, wanted to show how end user, in this case, uh, practice and clinician involvement is in, in important and that uh, the delivery of the value is highly dependent and the success is dependent on uh, how much uh, those who need those resources and those who develop those resources are involved. This is uh, to show our board of directors uh, from last year. Uh, we had some changes since then, but 
you can see the variety of organizations represented. It's extremely important to have a strategic uh, selection of who is leading the PBR and in what direction. And we wanted to make sure that at least half of our members, those are the blue names, are the practicing clinicians in the community. But the, the remaining seats are uh, occupied by strategic partners in our state who have a stake in the health uh, of the population and some stake in making that better through research. Let me uh, just very briefly reflect upon this, various ways to engage the membership um, through personal relationship, through our practice facilitators, through network coordinator visits. Uh, but also through peer-to-peer. -peer. So the peer pressure of uh, improve, someone is improving uh, their quality of care uh, and bragging about it to their colleagues is, is a very good way of, of uh, having that sort of quality uh, or, or friendly competition uh, as well as uh, uh, kindling interest in participation. Recognition is very important. There are so many ways of recognizing uh, PBR members. And those are very important, not just in the context of the PBR, but all, also how the PBR and member clinician is used in the community and by their patients. And retaining these members is, is, is important. I, I've spoken a little bit about how in different phases of the network development you need different strategies to grow or uh, sustain your network. This is just to show our current website. We redesigned it uh, a year ago. It's now uh, flashy uh, HTML5, uh, interactive. It's not static. There are lots of ways to interact with us through the website, uses social media, and has a lot of good content. We really uh, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, things that you can download, things that you can order, even a cardiovascular risk reduction program DVD that uh, one of our members developed with our help and now making, you know, she's making that available online. And this is a little bit about news and highlights and how we inform our membership, what kind of resources we use. We have an active newsletter as well that we uh, uh, leverage to inform as well as get their, our members' voice heard in it. Uh, not only our president writes and compiles this, but uh, members are also able to uh, showcase uh, their clinic in each uh, um, newsletter, which is a great resource of uh, creating pride as well as um, uh, ownership of the network. This is the, the way how we try to um, sort of systematize uh, idea generation and capture. This is basically a simple form that leads the person through a concept paper. And it's a non-threatening, very easy way of basically just answering questions. But at the end, you bas basically uh, created a concept paper, which then we take and our project development and advisory community, community, uh, uh, committee reviews it and scores it based on relevance, impact, feasibility, uh, and the scoring also occurs yearly in a yearly exercise when we collect questions and um, create the priorities. So there's a, a community level scoring, but there's also membership level scoring yearly on uh, research projects. And then finally, the board needs to approve every project, uh, needs to approve every project that the member undertakes. Uh, the network undertakes. So this is sort of a mechanism. We can talk a little bit about that if you're interested in it after, after this presentation. An example of how the listserv is used. Again, since 99, we have over 200 su subscribers, or almost 80% of our membership. And I just highlighted one uh, in 2014 April. We had eight, 80 messages and 15 threads, wide-ranging topics. One was a clinical observation or observations that came in sort of, we have a sort of a seminal surveillance track as well uh, on in our network about zoster uh, incidents uh, uh, in the community, which we then, then prompted a rapid poll through the listserv using simple survey tools of the membership. And the interesting results were then sent immediately to our state epidemiologist who connected uh, with the CDC and uh, obtain information. And within seven to 10 days, we had a 
small, almost a small pilot study, but certainly a very good informative feedback from CDC on this issue, which is very educational and uh, a, a great example of how uh, a hot topic can be turned around quickly uh, with a, a resource through a resource like this. Convocations, I mentioned last year was our 20th anniversary convocation. Is, is very important and uh, members highly value it and it is, is not like other meetings. It is really not talking heads, uh, talking to an audience. It's extremely engaged and we have fierce debates and, uh, and great sharing between members and uh, membership. This is uh, just showing our newsletter. Uh, this area is in the spotlight that I mentioned where a particular member clinic can showcase their uh, type of care, the work, what they do, the kind of research that they do with OKPRN. And then other, various other ways, we have an up project update section where we provide detailed uh, feedback on where the project, various projects are. But then individual members can all also get their voices heard in this newsletter. Lots of other resources, speaking to the resource side of our network, IT, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, we helped develop uh, about 20 different uh, IT systems internally uh, or applications apps. We have practice facilitators, best practices, uh, toolkits. You will see that on the website. Uh, and we also run help around the ClinIQ program, which is an FPEN-like evidence-based curriculum for residents that benefits both the residency curriculum, academic curriculum, as, and the network uh, with new potential research questions. We also prioritize these questions and put them in a pile, a pot, and send them through that prioritization process that uh, I uh, was talking about. I will not talk because uh, uh, we, we don't have a lot of time, but there's a new patient and en patient engagement track in our PBR and in a portfolio that we are building with the help of our, one of our faculty, uh, using the idea that a PBR and practitioners can nominate some of their patients uh, for a state-like uh, sort of patient engagement committee or group uh, that will then help us drive uh, the, the agenda of the PBRN to be not only practice-based uh, and centered, but also patient-centered. So you see this idea of P2 core, which is the idea of patient and practice-centered outcomes research. And we are proposing to be core in the PBRN community, at least in primary care, P core really should be P2 core, since care is never delivered on the air, it is always in the context of, 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 of primary care. Let me reflect upon practice facilitation. You will find a lot of good information. I didn't want to focus on this so much, uh, but you definitely need to know about uh, this very interesting uh, and evolving field. Um, again, reflecting that it's the practice facilitators are at implemented mo mostly in translational implementation, dissemination research, and quality improvement activities. Uh, we have done a review of literature in 2005 where we asked a lot of questions, and this is a seminal review in the literature that you can read and possibly you already read it, uh, so you're familiar with it. Uh, I would highlight that from early on, uh, facilitators have a, had a dual role being involved both in research and quality improvement activities and linking and trying to merge these activities into a field of quality improvement or implementation science. But the longitudinal relationship building is just as important as with PBR and development. Practice facilitators also are uh, all about relationships. Uh, that our definitions of, uh, functionally from our PBR and is facilitators, basically this is a new profession, you know, newly trained uh, professionals who are developed personal relationships for a longitudinal extended period of time, arching over individual projects. Uh, they help both with quality and research, uh, and they also help build the participant learning community through effective dissemination of ideas and best practices. Uh, you. I, I don't want to uh, uh, go into details here. You have that, had the chance to look at the origin of the concept from Great Britain, uh, and that early on they focused on prevention and communication. 
uh, in good and other practices, uh, that they had lots of different roles uh, around uh, change and being an agent of change, um, teaching, coaching, uh, although practice facilitation, practice coaching and are not necessarily the same. There are domains of each in, in practice facilitation uh, and being in advisory capacity and being in a sort of a capacity that catalyzes change. These are top 10 uh, skills of practice facilitators. Of course, internet, interpersonal skills top the chart and communication skills, but there are other things that are uh, important for many other uh, uh, jobs and many other works, work or roles that you can uh, see that they uh, need. Being flexible and, and mobile is also very important. These, uh, so they just travel around and ab must be able to solve problems and respond to uh, emerging problems quickly based on their training. Uh, the two types of employment and funding depending on whether you are in a national health care system or in a more fragmented system like ours. And so the government can be the employer or as in the case of the U.S. it's mostly uh, academic institutions and maybe increasingly quality organizations that are the employers. Their background is also varied depending on the, on the particular geographical area in the U.S. As you guessed, it tended to be extremely varied and eclectic. We too had all of those folks that you see listed, including a certified EMT. So this is an area that definitely is being uh, consolidated uh, with the National Practice Facilitator Training that a similar course uh, uh, that you are participating in except for practice facilitators uh, started next last year. Let me skip some of these. Uh, you will be able to, and I'm sure you read a lot about that, how we train facilitators, what areas they are training. The classic fields, chart reviewing, feedback, which is really just the beginning of quality improvement, are complemented with uh, more advanced uh, and sophisticated ways of um, group management and group facilitation, complex adaptive system theory and how it is applied uh, to primary care quality improvement, uh, and patient and community-centered research that is, of course, an important area now. Facilitation can be direct on site, face-to-face. -face. That's the classic and most uh, effective, but at the same time, uh, resource-intensive modality. It can be remote, just like this which is uh, very cost effective but uh, by itself is not uh, necessarily as effective. The jury is still out there and there are research projects looking at that. Uh, the consensus today is that some sort of mixed model it might be uh, the optimal where you have initial, definitely initial relationship building is in person but then uh, you also leverage technology. Um, we have seen this sort of distribution. Classically, we had our practice facilitators assigned to certain quadrants or areas of the state um, and held together and directed from a central office. This is really evolving and changing now with, the, with these large community-based projects, such as the Evidence Now collaboratives in this site, sort of arrangement is no, not long, no longer the case or not necessarily the case. There are some alternative ways of doing this. So the goals, what are the goals of facilitation? I would suggest that the same goals that we have for the AAA, to improve primary care quality, improve the financial viability of practices, and of course, the experience, both for patients and uh, for practice uh, staff and clinicians. These uh, practice facilitators really are helping build capacity. They are not to do the work uh, but the, the, their goal is to teach the practices how to acquire the skills and expertise to improve the quality of care. So this is just uh, showing the system thinking and how it is important <laughs> that uh, this is not about the person uh, and changing people, although sometimes <laughs> maybe necessary, but how we change systems and that's what facilitators are experts in and that's what they really study and know. So they, they are like an enzyme. They are able to change the energy barrier for a practice in a particular area. And then they are able to teach them 
how to do that. That's the part that, of course, the enzyme doesn't do. That's the difference. And then move on to the next uh, uh, practice and teach them how to do. So they are enablers and not to not our, the people who do the quality improvement. Well, they are teaching to fish and not so the, the person who supplies the fish. Uh, this is an interesting way of looking at which practices should get practice facilitation. This I shamelessly borrowed this from Lindy Knox, who is going to be one of your presenters from LANET, uh, showing that it's really those middle practices who are either functional or at least low functioning that will benefit from practice facilitation in any, truthfully, any QI assistance. Those who are in survival mode. Uh, may not, they are definitely not ready to do this. And those who are exemplars may or may not benefit, depending on the area. We know uh, nobody's exemplar in everything, so there is always room for improvement. But the core of, of the practice types would be in the middle. This is a very interesting chart, so I, I recommend that you, you uh, take a little time to study it. What kind of activities do, we, do these people do? Preventive services delivery studies, as well as quality improvement studies that help preventive services deliveries, chronic condition management, uh, such as uh, CKD or asthma, uh, building relationships, uh, cross-pollinating good ideas, uh, participating in linking university and uh, rural, public and private, PDR and zone, wonderfully positions to, to be uh, partnership building bridges. Uh, among their variety of entities, and boy, do we need that relationship building, especially between public and private academia and not non academic institutions. So, in translational science, again, going back to the chart, practice facilitation is an extremely important component uh, of, of knowledge translation and dissemination. Of course, there's a lot that's going on through health IT that facilitators can help with, and population health improvement what kind of projects they help with, um, patients with hyperlipidemia and management of various conditions, uh, patients with various conditions, uh, developing best practices for uh, prescription refills and how to manage mill shows, uh, how to develop a registry. Uh, these are uh, commonplace now, but not necessarily in the earlier days, and what components you need to manage a population of patients. Of course, they can help with uh, providing uh, feedback from patients, facilitating patient to practice the feedback on quality and satisfaction. Uh, and I would mention, under, underscore the last one, this is the Evidence Now project, the cardiovascular care and a prevention project, where here, at least in Oklahoma, we are recruiting up to 300 practices and will help them uh, implement evidence, emerging and new evidence in cardiovascular uh, care and risk reduction into practice, and that is one way how uh, practice facilitators are now used at the very high level, not just practice by practice, but coordinated at the state level. We currently have a, a, a cadre of 20 of these facilitators who work for this center uh, to help the practices improve cardiovascular care. One particular framework, QI framework, I, do, I would just highlight, and you can read much more about this, is the Solberg mode model of practice improvement that postulates that priority change capacity and change process content are extremely important as three domains and factors of practice improvement. And practice facilitators are able to impact all three of these domains. They are in improving priority of the, of the particular issue that needs to be addressed. They certainly uh, improve change capacity through a variety of ways, but they are also able to provide the particular means and venues through which facilitation as a method to improve uh, uh, practice-based ca care. This is an example where in a chronic kidney disease guideline uh, implementation study, we were not only able to in improve CKD care in a, in a uh, wave of 32 practices, but we were able to leverage the peer-to-peer -peer networking and uh, uh, teaching and resource sharing uh, functions to push the, these uh, advancements to a second wave of uh, practices and diffuse uh, what they have learned to them. 
uh, so that they could improve the quality of care in a shorter period of time and more effectively and more efficiently. It cost actually less. And practice facilitators played a critical role as well as the local learning collaboratives, which are other, another component of this kind of approach. How effective practice facilitators are, I can say that there's a consensus among professionals in the literature that is very effective and um, uh, it's an uh, established method um, of improving quality. In our case, we measured up to threefold increase when we compared it, uh, the improvement with or without practice facilitator. And our colleagues up in Canada measured a similar impact uh, of facilitation as well as a 1.4 uh, return on investment. So this is definitely more expensive than just telling practices what a bad job they are doing, but it is also effective. So it actually, there's a consensus that when done well, it's worth the investment. Of course, it's important who's reaping the benefits, whether it's the same entity or entities that invest into the facilitator, and that's a whole larger issue. But in general, there is a consensus that it's effective and efficient uh, to use practice facilitators. So just very briefly, because we are running out of time, there ha it has been uh, shown that solving community-level health problems is not a siloed uh, uh, approach. You cannot really use a, sort of a laser focus or siloed approach to do that. Problems in communities present as problem sheds, like watersheds. They touch on a lot of different things than we need to really work together as a community to solve those problems. This report, the Folsom report, was reiterated recently saying basically the same thing, that we need demonstration projects of showing how communities can come together. PBRs have a wonderful opportunity here. And I propose to you that this is the classic area of PBR research, in my opinion, at least if you pull about it, is largely over. And there's a new chapter that PBRs are opening, very challenging, but also at the same time very promising chapter, to address how PBRs can be partners and parts of communities of solutions that the Folsom Report alluded to early on. One example is this project that we are doing in three rural counties in Oklahoma, and we, as you see, assemble the entire community using county health improvement organizations another group of 501c3s who bring together the entire community in healthcare in, a, in an entire county to work with them how to uh, improve uh, the health of the population. This is interesting and a, a sort of an un-American approach because we, we either try to be co totally commercial or not very effectively try to uh, a traditional public health approach, none of which works really well because of the segmentation. So the problem shed or the uh, solving the problem shed would be here a, a, a sort of a, a third or alternative approach when nonprofits that are whose mission is to improve that particular community's health are able to convene uh, the, the interested parties and e able to become uh, financial um, organizations as well who can align some of the misalignment of not only the quality and healthcare parameters but also the financial parameters so that they, the, the particular local community can leverage those resources uh, maximally. Um, I will again just mention that the, the other uh, alternative solution to vertically integrated health systems and ACOs is the health extension system which is a, uh, modeled after the agriculture extension system and is about 100 years be, uh, ahead of us in figuring out that this is really human relationships, roots on the ground, that are able to not only bring people together, but are able to take what academia and researchers develop to the community and the same time, at the same time bring in the expertise of the community ex uh, um, inform academic research. And that human linkage relationship, either in the role of a practice facilitator or much more what facilitation is evolving into what you can call a health extension agent, uh, is a very promising and successful method. And just to portray that, 
our primary healthcare extension infrastructure in Oklahoma is evolving, and I'm happy to report that our Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Improvement Cooperative is now named after our uh, founder and mentor, Dr. Jim Mould, uh, which has a, a, a very good traction, uh, of course, in the community, and all these organizations are aligned uh, uh, around that institute or collaborative to, to do that. By the way, the health extension ID is in the ACA, in section 5405, but of course, money, <laughs> monies were not appropriated uh, as usual, but the ID is there at the highest levels. So what are the summer uh, take-home points from this uh, uh, lecture? Uh, PBR and communities it can be conceived as experimental forms following the nomenclature of agricultural extension, housing in the community, but invested in uh, linking the community to academia and bringing in the resources of researchers and research, aligning that with the needs of the community to bring about change. Uh, research must be member engaged and it's critical how you envision and uh, conceptualize as well as operationalize the bottom up aspect of the, of the PBRM. Uh, they develop research and development good ideas and practices, and uh, some of these have been disseminated. And again, I would refer you to the MapCrack website when we have that wonderful compendium, evolving compendium of PBM research, including uh, this chapter that we uh, are discussing now. Um, practice facilitation has been an important component of PBM work and QI work in general. and that PBRNs and PBR research seems to be at the crossroads of practice and patient engagement, as well as practice and community engagement. And communities of solutions is an idea that proposed early on and now uh, having new, new traction, how PBRNs can get into this new great world of uh, patient and community-centered research. And that health extension systems could be a, a viable alternative to ACOs and healthcare system based uh, healthcare improvement, especially in rural states. Uh, that would be my presentation. I, I apologize, I ran a little bit longer, but I would like to open the uh, floor to questions. Well, um, Dr. Nagy Kaldi, thank you so much for that comprehensive presentation. Uh, really wonderful. Um, I have a number of questions for myself, but uh, I'm going to hold back because what we've done is we've asked one fellow um, for each webinar to prepare questions for the speaker. And this month, our fellow that's uh, going to be do doing that is Andrew Hunt from Case Western and the, the Brain Psychiatry PBRN. So Andrew, would you like to ask your first question? And then after that, um, I, other fellows can go ahead and ask their questions. So Andrew, go ahead. Sir, um, I'm actually I'm posting this as a chat question thing too. Um, uh, but basically, I feel that I've I've mm -hmm. been the key at different points in my career throughout. Um, and um, as we develop our PBR in Cleveland, I'm I'm having thoughts about uh, my role, how being a director of something is different than being a P, or if there really is no difference at some level. Uh, if you're trying to create an expanding network of, of people, aren't you always kind of boundary crossing and spanning? Um, and Could you speak up a little bit more? I need to plug in plug in my headset so that it's, it comes through very faintly, but I can certainly plug in my headset to help that. So you were asking about the role of the P and how that is different from a network uh, director. Am I hearing it correctly? Yeah. Like, is, a, is there a big difference between the leadership roles and the P role, you know, some, except by scope, you know? Yes. Well, let me respond to that. P role is really not a leadership position in a, in a PBR, and uh, uh, P's and practice facilitators are the extension agents, the agents of change locally in those practices and communities. So they would take uh, the, the leadership uh, PBR's leadership uh, advice, what they do do uh, is uh, informing the leadership in terms of how things are going, what the priorities are, and what very tangible technical issues em emerge in the field. So the piece that linkage the agent between the PBR and leadership and the practices rather than being the leadership. 
Would that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just find that when I'm reaching out to, like, new people we want to engage that um, I'm playing a mm-hmm. like role sometimes. Right. Now, this could be a track, of course. I myself uh, did practice facilitation early on in 2001 or so. For a while, I was a facilitator myself. And so that was greatly helpful and informative because uh, as the Roman army has done, you have to do every step of of that. Uh, you have to go through the ranks, right, to really know what kind of uh, directions you should provide, what is feasible, what is not feasible, right? So in that regard, it, it's a good track for a, a leader or researcher to do some facilitation early on if they are the type of personality who is good for that. Do you typically advise your researchers to take P roles? Well, it really depends, again, on the personality. Not every researcher and academic, a typical academic may or may not be an ideal uh, facilitator. Some are. Uh, mm-hmm. Because it requires a different personality and skills. But if you have those traits uh, and you would like to really have a good sense of, of get your hands dirty uh, in quality work, doing practice facilitation is great. It's a great way to do that. Uh, how you evolve from that, that, that that's another question. Okay. Um, I had one more follow-up that maybe others could comment on or something. Um, what's the, uh, the typical lifespan or career path of a P? Okay. Who do you reach out to to, to, like, enroll, to uh, recruit for P's? Right. Well, we had, let me address the first of, we had these who have been with us for over 10 years. So it can be very rewarding and those who like this kind of work in general will have a great time doing that. As you said, some are evolving and going and getting a degree and so forth. We had at least two of them who were MPHs who uh, didn't want to get a new degree and they, they enjoyed it and continually enjoy it uh, for quite a few years. Uh, now, who who are good people uh, to do that? You saw that it's uh, interpersonal skills and communication skills top the chart. So you can teach people a lot of things. You can teach methodology. You can teach uh, research uh, basics. It's very good if they have that. So that's why we love, love working with MPHs because they got a very solid foundation of not only research methodology, but as I mentioned increasingly uh, importantly, uh, public health, community health uh, background as well, although that's a certain type of training, but still. Uh, So MPHs are are great. They have both. And then they do need to have that kind of personality and ability to to really freely communicate, bring bring people together. They need to be people, people's person. Uh, A person who doesn't like working with people wouldn't work. And of course, no primary care clinician, right, would be in that category. It doesn't like people or working with people. Hope. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, another question from one of the fellows. Okay, I'm looking at this. Oh, hello. This is Alex Cho calling from Duke. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I was, um, you know, fascinated by um, your, your comments about the, the health system, um, you know, being a, a tough mess to crack, and you mentioned one of the barriers to engaging the health system being the fact that there are these overlapping um, uh, performance improvement structures and mechanisms within a health system, right, that might be seen as uh, duplicating what a PBRN might do in terms of quality improvement. Um, can I ask if, 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 if the, you have um, encountered particular situations or um, can speak to um, how to address that challenge? Yeah, the typical situation is that there are some health systems that truly do a good, good job of quality improvement and they may not need the kind of resources in general and they may even have resources for uh, uh, evaluation and analysis, but there are plenty others who say they do quality improvement, but when, when you have the chance, you even get the chance to check, 
you still see very substantial gaps, not only in their core uh, organization, but very much so in their ancillary or primary care practices that they just purchased and they just put the name on the front of the clinic but, and gave them a new EMR, but they didn't really do anything else. And coming to them with that message that, you look, you're saying you're doing quality improvement, but look at, look at it, you're not really doing it. That's a tough message, right? Uh, and uh, saying that right. we can help you be better. So uh, what we tried so far was to try to uh, play on our strengths and say, yeah, I mean, you, you do, must be doing a great job and you have great resources, but how about the, the, the qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis expertise? You know, how about the expertise of being able to, uh, uh, you, know, you may know your silo and system, but you are required, especially in nonprofits, uh, work with the, and impact the community. You may or may not have good ties with, to that community. How do you, how can you manage that? So in those areas, we can propose that we have some advantage and expertise we can bring in. And some health systems buy that message and uh, are, are willing to collaborate. Thank you. Okay, I see one on the chat. The next How question. Do you, okay, is that the yeah, one? Go ahead. How do you see the facilitator roles in a continuously changing health systems, PCMA, JCO? How would their role be different? Okay, so there are two schools of thoughts. One is that the facilitators will evolve into health extension agents. And instead of focusing on individual practices, now they are fo focusing on a larger community. Uh, another school of thought, and I tend to uh, belong to that, is that no, we, we still need that QI facilitator role down in, in, or in the practices on the ground. But then we need related, but not exactly the same expertise of a community facilitator or community extension agent which then will work closely together with the facilitator. And that is exactly what we do in that project that where I showed that busy uh, color uh, uh, graph, where we have wellness coordinators who are working with the, the CHEOs and the community, but we also have a practice facilitator, and the two are working closely together to address different domains, the local practice domain, and, ha and then also the practice, uh, the community domain of health improvement, and of course they need to be aligned. And so that's, that's the advantage of having uh, organizations like the CHEOs because they could work with all of these roles and a personnel to align what they do so that what the practices are doing are in the same realm or campaign, in our case we have a wellness campaign, that the community wants to accomplish. Is there another question in the chat there that hasn't been addressed, or have you have you answered these questions? Yeah, uh, my name is Minyana, and I sent out a question uh, to the uh, to the to the uh, like a task right. force, and I don't know if you see that. It's regarding yeah. the uh, mechanism, yeah, of the uh, spreading your uh, research idea to the uh, network members. Yes, I, I think most PBRs have some sort of mechanism, but I think uh, relatively fewer PBRs might have a, a, a rigor, more rigorous system in place. Everybody has some sort of capturing of the question and some sort of uh, mechanism to prioritize questions, but our suggestion is that you can do that very systematically and effectively if you have some of these. Not only that, but now we have a project from PCORI where we try to figure out how P PBRs can help bring in, for example, value of information assessment expertise, which is a very specific field uh, and expertise that can certainly contribute, which in addition to relevance and cost and, and feasibility and whatnot, it also adds the perspective of the end user uh, from a viewpoint that how, how valuable this information is really and uh, for how long it will be how valuable and how long time does it take to, to develop the question and whether the value will decrease or the information will decrease by the time you develop that question. And so those are more sophisticated questions 
and some of the PBRs are now thinking about those as well. But uh, yes, the mechanism is important, and I recommend that you think about a system to uh, pull questions in, and as well as uh, prioritize them, and then respond to them. And of course, the last step is how you match funding with them, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one more question. Who has another question? So, so if, if it, do you have one? If not, I, I will have a, I would have a question. Yes, go ahead. In general, um, since you are at various levels of PBR, does this make sense and is this helpful, what I have, I, I have uh, presented? Did you find something that, uh, that you can take uh, and, and uh, improve your PBR with, in general? Okay, uh, um, my name is Midian again, and uh, I feel that, yeah, this seminar is very helpful, and I get to know the uh, infrastructure of the uh, PBRN, and then you're, you know, you're with a successful uh, PBRN running, and um, uh, with many, uh, you know, projects, and uh, conducted within the network, and I especially I know this uh, this mechanism of accepting the uh, concept paper and different things. So I think it's very helpful for me to know you know the infrastructure and then the uh, uh, how to uh, how these uh, you know members are recruited. And uh, if I need to uh, initiate a uh, practice-based research, and I I kind of know you know what 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 kind of organization I'm dealing with. And that's very helpful. And I, I do have another uh, very uh, simple question: Is you mentioned there's a board of directors? Should the uh, board of directors include at least one representative from the, uh, the each practice uh, within the uh, the network? Well, uh, sir, first of all, if you decide to have be, do that sort of mixed model, that that's when you would have a board of directors. So that only if you have a 51C3, that's also an IRS requirement. But you could have some sort of board or uh, committee, even if you are not a 51C3. And I guess if you have a relatively few practices, that could be the goal. But if, if in a larger network, that is, is really not the goal. The way we strategically select the clinician and other members are that we will go through a list of sort of uh, important criteria. So of course, we look at gender, we look at ethnicity, uh, distribution, but importantly, we also look at what areas they uh, represent, and being more forward-looking in this is important. So not only what areas of PBR work should be represented on the board, but what is going to happen in the next two, three, five years, for which you need a representative for, for an organization. For example, recently we lost two of our DO members and our OSU, although in football they are our rivals, but in research they are, we are in very good working relationship, and we just lost the DO representation, and that school is very important, and we have a lot of rural clinicians, DO, so we are really looking for those members strategically to be involved. Does that make okay. sense? Thank you. Yes, yes, thanks. And I also comment that I uh, like the information regarding the PAs, and then uh, you talk about the qualities of PAs and the uh, the, the training, and then uh, that's required in the, for the uh, PAs to best work uh, to facilitate the uh, you know other projects. Um, it's very helpful because I I generally have a question like I feel I, I do uh, interact with some PAs many times I feel like. Uh, what what they're doing, and I'm doing all the work. They're looking over my shoulder, and then just <laughs> you know, uh, giving me all these uh, information, questioning, you know, the, all these population management. Um, but the the new concept did, you just did you so did you mention P as a physician assistant? That's what you that you mean. That's no, the uh, PEA is not the uh, it's the uh, practice oh, enhancement. Oh, PEAs. Okay. Okay. PAs? Uh, yes, okay. Okay. PEAs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, and so I, I, just I, perked, I just perked up because involving physician assistance PAs is a new passion of mine here, and I propose to you that they are untapped resource and a wonderful resource, and they need increasingly more academic credit. And tap into that resource, PAs, MPs in your PBRN, wonderful resources. 
Okay, okay. sorry, I Thank cut you. you off. No, no, I, I, I was just like I had a, a better understanding of the role of PA and uh, in the LPBR uh, network. Okay. Um, and so you you also mentioned this new concept that they're there they're not there to do the work but they're to, they're they're there to build the uh, capacity, and then that's something that we can uh, think about it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, very so wonderful. Well, okay. Good. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, John. I'm just reading the comments. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for the comments. I will. That I'm definitely reading it and uh, appreciate it. Well, we appreciate so much uh, you spending time with us today. This was a, a, a great education in uh, practice-based research and the use of practice facilitators, among many other issues that were brought up. Um, so what, what we'll do is I'll, I want to make a couple of announcements. And then, uh, Joel, if you're available, we can continue this question and answer period because I see that there's at least another question, perhaps a few more. Uh, would that work for you? Sure. Okay. Okay, so if people have to sign off, I want to make a few quick announcements. Um, we'll have the guidelines for the concept paper and the learning plan to you within the next couple of days. We're in the last uh, final phases of developing that. Um, we'll be uh, contacting each fellow to schedule phone calls with fellow and, the, and your mentor. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be contacting you to do that, and those calls will take place in the next few months. Um, just to touch base and see where you're at, see if you have any questions about the program. Um, and the next webinar will be on November 19th. It will be by L.J. Fagnan and Melinda Davis from the Oregon uh, Practice-Based Research Network. will be on the recruitment and engagement of clinicians, practices, patients, and healthcare systems, and the card study method. So that is going to be another excellent webinar. Okay. So, um, uh, Jolt, we can go ahead and uh, address the, take the next question if you're ready to do that. Go ahead. Um, I don't know that this has been responded to. How do you see PBRN changing practice guidelines in the near future? And I assume you mean how PBRNs would be able to influence the development and quality of practice guidelines, right? Uh, well, as early as 2006, ARC called us together, uh, with, including several PBRN members, uh, leaders how to improve this process. And when you look at the research pipeline, I think the critical por part is we need to be at the table. <coughs> Primary care and the pre movement in general has been on the menu for so long be because we were not at the table. I think encouraging our young, especially younger generation of clinicians to be very active uh, in terms of policy healthcare policy, but also uh, research-related policy and guideline development at the highest levels, uh, federal government, local government, uh, is, is really important. Uh, the only way to match the power of other organizations who uh, get their voices heard loudly is that we are also going out and uh, not so much competing with them, but rather really telling the people how great this and how thing is and how important it is and how PBRNs are essential. That a little bit relates to what I alluded to the uh, uh, image and sort of uh, marketing. I think we need to learn in general how to market PBRNs better. That will help us tremendously. Great. Is there another question for Dr. Nagikaldi? Okay, it looks like uh, folks, many folks have left the room, uh, and this has just been a, a great opportunity to learn from someone who has experienced a, a, a great uh, deal of uh, different situations um, and the development of a PBRN that is really on the cutting edge. So, Jolt, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, okay. Thank you for giving great. me the opportunity. Appreciate it so much. And we'll see you at NAPCREG 
here in a, That's right. in a short time. Got down there. <laughs> Bye -bye. Okay, great. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for your help.